filled it with the manure, and we put the food waste on the Egypt working on the concept of how to turn Egypt into a Heliopolis, which means a city of the sun, which is the name of ancient, ancient Cairo. And I was steeped in utopian literature at the time. I mentioned before about my love of Epcot and experimental prototype communities of tomorrow and, and trying to make the world a better place. And in Egypt, uh, I was showing people that not only was the town we were living in originally called Heliopolis, the city of the sun, but that Thomas Campanella in the 1500s had written a utopian guidebook, if you like, called City of the Sun, shortly after Thomas More had written Utopia, before Francis Bacon had written New Atlantis. And there is a whole spate of utopian movements around the world, but they all seem to share one goal in common, which was that you have to have a source of energy that's reliable and is available to everybody, and the sun was that source of energy. So even though we were working on many aspects of the sustainability development puzzle, we had started out building solar hot water systems with the poor out of local recycled materials. We quickly realized that not everybody has access to direct sunlight and that this was going to be a fantasy either because the cost of photovoltaic panels was very high or the materials to build solar hot water systems was very uh, hard to, to get and engineer for most people, but mostly because in urban environments in the city, buildings are shading one another. And so not everybody has equal access to the sun and solar rights becomes an issue. How much do you have a face that's not shaded by trees, not made by buildings? But one source of sunlight that we all have access to is food. And we started thinking back, talking with the fellahin, talking with the, 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 the farmers and the food growers about competing for sunlight and realized that it was always a competition for sunlight, but because we all had food and food waste, we had embedded solar energy coming to our communities every single day and then leaving our communities when we flushed the toilet and when we threw food in the garbage. And that all the recycling in the world with wonderful recycling containers were only taking the embedded solar energy that was in newspaper, that was in plastic, that was in the manufacture of glass, that all was solar energy as well. In some form or another, fossil fuels are stored solar energy after all. The sun grew plants that decayed and turned into oil. So it was all about using solar energy and then getting rid of it. And we were getting rid of so much of it, not realizing how much was actually contained in waste that we controlled as people. The stuff that we don't eat today, for example, represents an enormous amount of solar energy. So Solar Cities then became an organization that used the acronym, and it's fairly long-winded, of Connecting Community Catalysts. That's the C cubed. So we're all in each community, there are catalysts who want to make change, but they need to be connected or they don't have much power. So our primary mission was connecting community catalysts in the urban environment, integrating technologies for industrial ecology solutions, meaning solutions that made our industrial world replicate the natural world, creating ecologies where there was no waste, where everything flowed together and created a coherent whole. And it would all be driven by the sun, but we would show that sunlight is everywhere and that there's more efficient ways to use sunlight than the traditional thought of using photovoltaics or using even wind energy, which is solar energy. The sun heats air, it rises and creates wind, right? Or hydroelectric is solar energy because the sun heats water, which rises and rains and forms rivers and things. So everything's really solar energy except for nuclear and geothermal. But there's more, there are easier and more efficient ways to get at that solar energy and ours became building communities with stable solar energy from the plate, because it's something that we all had. Uh, the C-cubed, as I mentioned, is connecting community catalysts. We really are believers that, that you can teach a person to fish and then they'll have fed themselves for a lifetime, that we shouldn't be giving fishes. And unfortunately, with most technologies, we still end up giving fish, even though we can teach people how to use photovoltaics and wind and, and, and uh, micro turbines and you name the technology, we're still giving fish away because not everybody can do it. And we thought there's got to be something that everybody on the planet can do, regardless of their socioeconomic status or circumstance, and regardless of their geography. And so we're looking for those community catalysts. The mission then, as I mentioned, was to integrate all of these technologies so that we have these solutions that create a better ecology. But we thought, let's start with something where we can use local expertise so that those community catalysts who are already there can simply embrace this section. And we're responsible for getting them the knowledge of the technology that makes it an industrial ecology component. And the one that we've settled on 
that you see me here in Brazil doing is we settled on a Chinese technology from a company in Shenzhen that has a similar mission to ours. And we settled on this technology for a couple of reasons. One, because for the size and the amount of gas that we can get from food waste and from toilet waste, which are those two primary forms of solar energy we all have, uh, it's the cheapest in the long run, it's the easiest, and community catalyst, if they know how to do plumbing, and they know how to lay foundation, if they know how to build a building, build a slab, or a basement, they've already got all the skills. So there's no real training you have to do. You say to any basic builder, uh, we're going to build a biodigest <coughs> using steel form molds, and we need to put a rebar in, they go, yeah, I got it. So the training turns out to be really minimal, because there's nothing special about this technology that local communities don't already have. Uh, we are a community of biogas innovators, educators, and community builders, and Rebecca, who's a long-term friend of mine going back over a decade, is one of our board members, and I think that's how we all are here. We all have Rebecca in common. She's this incredible uh, uh, tinkerbell uh, spreading your pixie dust and making people fly, making ideas fly. So we have a great debt of gratitude. And Rebecca brought me to Principia College and uh, had me do a keynote speech a couple years ago and then had been working with me um, uh, on this particular initiative and giving a lot of advice and making a lot of contacts. And then this past year she invited me and they awarded me with the Visionary of the Year Award at Principia and I did a big biogas workshop there and taught Principia students how to make their own biogas systems and we're going to be making bigger ones with them later. Um, and then she said, look, let's take this to even higher levels and introduced us to Chief Orville Looking Horse and to Phil Lane Jr. And we began dialogues about how this could be a solution for communities that had been marginalized, disenfranchised uh, all over the world, reviving the native know-how, the very deeply embedded local knowledge that had sustained peoples for thousands of years. And now that our global civilization has crisis, can take that indigenous knowledge, marry it with global knowledge about case study successes, and create something that would be robust to any kind of collapse, whether it's environmental or economic or, or social. Uh, so we're working with that and working with the United Religions Initiative, seeing that this is a, this is a, a human adventure that is, uh, has the spiritual uh, blessing of almost every religious tradition that we know of, that uh, we have direct access to the bounty that our Creator has blessed us with, that that cornucopia is not just what we're consuming, but also what we're throwing out on the other side. So it completes the cycle of life. So we provide open sourced resources for developing and deploying sustainable solutions for what we call flourishing societies. Sustainable development seems too pale. What do we want to sustain? We just sustain ourselves as if, eh, and are we sustaining the right thing? So flourishing societies would be something that is literally bursting, blooming, and growing because we're connecting all of the pieces. Our goal right now are, are very concrete goals, and actually concrete is a good word to use, and you see the concrete. Our concrete goal is to establish biogas hubs all across the U.S. and we've imported the molds twice to the United States. We have one set of molds, these Chinese molds that make these biodigesters that you see here that can provide uh, up to uh, 24 hours of cooking gas every day for a family of, um, I would say if you had the waste of a family of eight to 10 people, you could provide electricity for a good, uh, I think 10 hours from that, and, and cooking fuel certainly for 24. Uh, with one of these, um, we brought one set of molds last year that's in Ohio right now, we have another set that's in Pennsylvania, just finished, as you can see here, building North America's very first winter performing biodigester. There's the foam insulation. And we now are then taking these molds to Abby Rockefeller's farm, where instead of building underground, which was the situation there, she has a small greenhouse, and we're going to build the first American above ground family scale biodigester that will help to heat the greenhouse. And this is a very small model. The greenhouse is bigger than this, but just a little too. And they'll grow plants because it produces this rich fertilizer. So a lot, and then it'll move on from there to the Permaculture Institute, Design Institute that Kathy Puffer introduced us to with Andrew Faust, one of the big permaculture leaders in America. And it'll go through that network. And the idea is this one set of molds will be a traveling circus. It'll go from location to location to location. Within a week, they'll pour cement 
put it, load it with manure, get it started, start feeding it, and then we'll take the molds out, bring them to the next location. So we're just with a truck, we'll take them around. But that we've calculated if the molds that we have, and there's another organization as the first molds you brought in, so they're going to try an independent thing. They're working with, uh, they're trying to work with um, with Ohio, uh, Ohio State. So there's a set of molds there, and then there's our molds. Our molds, unlike theirs, we have said will be completely open source, i.e. We are not trying to make this a business model for us. We want these molds lent out to people. We do want cost recovery because we need to buy new sets of molds, but we want to make sure that there's no barriers. So our molds will go to Native American communities. They'll go to places that URI suggests they should go. They'll go to permaculture communities. They'll go to the Mennonite and the Amish communities. They'll go wherever people are struggling and can't afford to rent this and they'll become part of this hub. But it would take us, since you, at the best, if you really worked hard, you can build a biodigester every week using the molds. And to be realistic with the logistics and planning, you really want to factor in two weeks to get the molds to the list location, set up, port. So we realized that the best we could realistically do is do 30 biodigesters per year. I have a question. Yeah. Can we build those molds? ourselves in yes. Central America, for you example, sure we can. have a lot of talented people with metallurgy training. Absolutely. And what Dr. Wong, the inventor of this, who has the patent on this, has said is he wants to be the Jonas Salk of biogas. He said, I don't make my money, he said, with the small family systems. I make my money on the huge molds for 200 to 5,000 cubic meter systems for industries. That's where the big bucks are. He says, so all I want to do is I want the credit for it, and if there's a licensing, if people are making a profit, I should get the same money that I get when I sell the molds if they're manufactured here. And he says, it's good for me because I don't want to pay shipping. Nobody likes exactly. to pay shipping. So there's a lot of that. But our, our thought was, since we can only, with one set of molds, get at most 30 biodigesters built per year, what we really need, since there's millions of households that need this, is we need at least one set of molds in every one of the 50 states in America we need to go and provide the training once. Once they get it, they get it. Once they've got one build in the ground, the local expert can then make their own business model with them. They can they find ways to then get themselves uh, so that they can get a financial position where they can do this every week or every two weeks and have it spread with these points of light all over the United States from at least one hub in every one of the 50 states. We are also doing the same thing in Europe. We just brought in the first molds to Europe that are still in the port in Portugal. We're having big problems with Portuguese customs. In fact, they're charging us the same amount to get them in the country as we paid for the molds. So that's 5, the problem, that's the problem in, in Central yeah. America. It's going to be the tax issue, importing the molds. That's why. <laughs> yeah. So we, we, we brought them in. We're, we're paying the 5,000 euro charge to get was basically $7,000 of euro worth of goods in. We're also buying another set of molds for Ireland sometime this spring, and because you can't do southern and northern Europe simultaneously with one set of molds, and the Irish are way behind this, and then we're bringing them to Findhorn, Scotland for the Global Echo Village Network Plus 20 conference to build at Findhorn, which you may have heard of, it's the, the hub of Echo Villages. So we're building in Tamara in Portugal, which is the solar village in April, and then we hope to do one and then have these molds going from north, south through Germany and the others going from Portugal up through Spain and have them somewhere in the middle. But it's a, with the desperation we feel in this era of climate uncertainty, in this era of uh, unmitigated pollution, water pollution, land pollution, food problems, starvation, refugees coming, uh, we want to get the molds, the southern molds out to um, the, the Lampa, Lampa, Duce, Lampa. Huh? Lampedusa? Lampedusa, where the Tunisian refugees come when they come to Italy, the island where the refugee island is. There's so many refugee situations. And of course, the Middle East is a big area for us. That's where Taha comes from. That's where my family comes from. We have very robust initiatives in Israel and Palestine. Uh, and uh, our colleagues from Egypt have gone on to Jordan. So there's a lot happening there, but that's another thing we can do. We got the first molds we brought to Iraq, and they're in Iraq, but they're locked up. Locked up because of political concerns. They were a gift of the American people, even though they're Chinese molds. And so with this ISIS crisis, nobody wants to touch that. So our molds, he built, he risked his life to build Iraq's first 10 cubic meter system, and then the molds were impounded from Iran. But they're there. 
They're, they're steel, they're not going anywhere. So we want to demonstrate commercial level hydroponic use of the bio slurry for food production. So Kathy and Janice, our other team member, who's with two other team members at the Botanical Gardens now because of our uh, horticultural part of this, made these wonderful models for my talking turkey. These are tower gardens, and the tower gardens are a commercial product now that Kathy, what part of her business is selling uh, and promoting and using the tower gardens. Do you want to say something about that? Because I shouldn't speak for you, you're oh, in the room. Sure. Um, actually, I am um, growing hydroponically with um, the bio slurry, the compost tea that is from my um, you know, biodigester that you installed and we have in our house. And so I do a 10 to 1 ratio of the compost tea or bio slurry to water and I'm growing 100%, you know, um, without any extra nutrients um, whatsoever because it has the NPK that the plants need to grow. And, um, you know, plants are green, they're beautiful and, you know, having wonderful produce like year round growing hydroponically indoors with the lights. Yeah, it, the big barrier for hydroponics, you're probably all aware, is that while it's very uh, inexpensive in terms of once you've built the system, it will operate more or less indefinitely because you're using PVC pipes and pl cell plumbing. Uh, the nutrient cost is what we're defeating people. And the insight that we had is, well, uh, evidence was showing from China and India and Nepal and, and uh, Kenya that farmers were getting fantastic results using direct bio slurry from a biodigester in India, I was brought up to people's roof, and uh, they were growing most of their vegetables on the roof from their kitchen waste the day before. And that's an interesting story that I have to just take an aside and, and, and tell. The first time I encountered home-scale biogas, I was in Pune in a slum, and I went to see the inventor of this system here, which is taking a water tank, plastic water tank, lopping the top off, putting a feeding pipe on the side, and another pipe for the fertilizer to come out, filling it with water and manure, and then taking another tank, lopping the bottom, the top off of that, turning it upside down, and putting it inside with a hole for the gas. And it farts, as all stomachs will, and it raises this up and fills with gas, and it goes down. But I didn't know, so I went to this family's home, and I'm used to going into Indian homes, and they're caked with carbon, and there's just black everywhere, and you can't breathe, and you're hacking and coughing. And it was completely clean, and the paint was so bright and vivid on the walls, and the little children were running around, and they offered me a, a meal, and they were cooking, and they were cooking on gas on a stove like this. And I looked at the flame; it's a beautiful blue flame. Of course, there's no smoke; it's gas, mm -hmm. natural gas. And I said, "Where's your bottle?" Because I was used to the riots in Egypt when the gas bottle prices would go up, and everybody's trying to keep several bottles for the time. And they said, "No, no, no bottle, no bottle." I was like. Whoa. Where, where, where are you getting your gas? And they go, oh, up, up there. And I follow this plastic hose. It was a garden hose, actually. I follow it out the window, and I go, can I go see? I'm like, yeah. So I go up the stairs of this apartment building, going up and going up. I get to the roof of a four-story apartment building, and there's this water tank, like many roofs have. And the hose goes into the water tank. I was like, that's a water tank. They go, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I look, and there's all this hydroponics going on on the roof. So, what? And they go, Yes, why do you see the gas will come from this tank? And I look in, it's filled with water up to here. And I put my nose up to it, and it has a slightly barn-like odor. And this thing was down because they'd been cooking all day, so there was still about 15, 20 minutes of gas left. When it's up like this, you have two hours. But it was down like this. And then I, I suddenly made the connection. And they said, yeah, we throw our food waste in, and then uh, we get this gas. And I started to cry. And I realized I was being overwhelmed by an emotion that it was so simple and for 20 years I've been doing sustainable development and no one had ever told me that you could just take a couple of water tanks and put it on your roof and feed it your poop. So I went home and I built one and I started on my baby's diaper wastes. I had a baby, the wife would say, change the baby's diapers. I used to go, oh, yeah. then I go, yeah, sure. And I put him into a little tank in the bathroom and sure enough I got biogas and I started taking the baby's uh, bry when he wouldn't eat scraping that and all the food waste and got even more gas. I was like, it really works. Wow, you can live off your baby's diapers and the food they don't eat. You're going to finish your plate. You're like, no, no, don't finish your plate. I'll take it. Go out more cooking fuel. So this was, this, was this, this revelation for me and that they were able to then grow incredible food without buying any fertilizer at all, which is the farmer's nightmare. And then in Israel, they showed us that they didn't need soil at all. You got sand, great. Sand and slurry. 
And then you realize that all this conflict that we've had over arable land, all this conflict we've had over clean water, down in Mexico in the Yucatan, we were working with a community just this past winter, and they had rotoplast water tanks they bought specifically to set up on a block so they could fertilize with drip irrigation for the first time because they're very rocky and fertile soil in the Yucatan, as you know. Yeah. And yet, they were still buying fertilizer. And we said, just put your food waste and animal waste into that same tank and you'll never have to buy fertilizer again. You'll grow soil. So it became a revelation, and that's what Kathy is now the first person we know of in the United States who is doing all of her vertical aeroponics completely on her kitchen garbage in 24 hours. That's the turnaround, not three weeks, three months, six months to make compost. But it's because she uses an incinerator, which I was on stage at National Geographic in 2010, and I was asked, Dr. Colleen, of all the technologies you've presented, wind, solar, geothermal, hydro, blah, blah, what's the most important one for the 21st century, as if there's some silver bullet? And you know there isn't. So, but the cameras are there, and I said, well, it would have to be if I just picked one that I need to bring with me around the world, and I do, it would be the incinerator. And they said, well, what? You mean the garbage disposal? I said, yes, if you have a garbage disposal, then you're able to grind up food wastes and other organics into something where the surface area to volume ratio is so small, uh, so large, because the particles are so small, that microbes will work with you at a rate that's useful to them and you, and we avoid pollution problems. The problem is always rate in nature. We're producing trash faster than nature can assimilate it. You grind it up and make it small enough, in your case, 24 hours you get your gas, 24 hours you get your fertilizer. None of this turning piles, carrying, can't put meat or bones or can't put fats. And no, you put everything, right? Yes. As do we in my home in Germany. And it, it just works. You grind it up and then nature does the thing. So that's the demonstration that we can close the cycle. We've had a lot of success since 2000, uh, January of 2009, late 2008 when we began this. We did build America's first Pusheen 10 cubic biomass at the Homestead Farm in PA. Um, first basement biodigester successfully producing biogas during the winter in Kathy's house. There was a lot of concern, is it safe? At Mercy College, I built one in a laboratory and proved over the year that it was completely safe to do indoors in an unventilated room. We of course have a gas monitor there and we, we checked on, on levels, but it was safe. And then Kathy and her husband and their two little girls volunteered to be the first experiment in the United States. Can we build one in a family's basement? Uh, with our own hands, and we did. And after a few uh, spills and plumbing problems, we got it all sealed up tight, and now that's what you have here is Kathy's gas from the previous day's kitchen garbage from her basement. We also built one in the basement of Abby Rockefeller, about 45 minutes away from Kathy, and we built one then in Janice Kelsey's backyard and put it in the greenhouse and showed that we could compost heat it. And in the winter, you could pile compost on it and then that would keep it warm in the winter. We've done uh, the first IBC Arty system to the Bapte Relief Alliance in Agropacaria for the um, in uh, Dominican Republic. Yucatan's first urban biogas digester on the roof in Merida. Swaziland's food waste to fuel and fertilizer biogas solution with Google Science Fair uh, and Scientific American where we gave awards to kids doing hydroponics in Swaziland and to kids in India doing new toilets brought the kids from India with their new toilet design, brought the kid, went to the place in Swaziland where they're doing hydroponics and then brought the biogas and connected all three systems together and that's ongoing. Cordoba High School in Alaska showing that you could use lake mud with the psychrophilic bacteria that live in Alaska under the permafrost and get the better gas. First biodigester in Palestine, a kibbutz Lotanako village, uh, trained people from all over the world and came up with an education model for Israeli-Palestinian cooperation. The nice thing about working with the kibbutz and Echo Village and with the Arava Institute is it's an interfaith initiative and because it has international visitors working with local people, it spreads out from Israel and Palestine into the rest of the world. That's a model we want to replicate everywhere else. If you have developing countries and developed countries that are in association, use the, developing, the developed countries because of their connections, their, their, the capital they've accumulated, the resources and technology, and use those as training hubs, and then people can come and train and go out, and you have some uh, ability to create these learning hubs. 
Uh, also, um, we've developed an open source IBC system that we field tested at the Seachem farm in Egypt and in science schools outside of Cairo that we publish and make available to anybody in the world to build so nobody has to, uh, has to buy a system. They can build it out of local materials. Sonoma County in Los Angeles, uh, we did the first ones in California. And then we are building a Darbal Ahmar and, and uh, Manchiat Nasser with the Dabalin garbage pickers of Cairo. There's a Muslim community uh, we've built in and a Christian community that historically have had severe problems. And they work together now every day building biodigesters, Hussein Farag and Mustafa Hussein working with Hana Fatin. And there, there's a, this group of, of Muslims and Christians in Egypt where they collect all the garbage because they have lots of garbage uh, there. Um, you can see here Kathy's system in her basement with her husband Ed, and there's two of these tanks. These are the IBC tanks that we they're called international bulk containers. They're shipped all over the world. So our insight in 2009 was we could find something that everybody could use. That's our open source system, and so this is in Janice's backyard, working with my students uh, and local community people. This is their basement. This is Rotoplas in Mexico at the factory in Leon building this same system here, the Arti India, with our modification, putting in bacterial hotels. We want to increase surface area so we can give it more food by giving more bacteria places to live. Because there's limitations to how much you can feed a given system. So by making more space, and now Rotoplast is talking about doing commercial production. We're not sure when that will start. Um, and then there's the one in Jody's backyard. It's the Pusheen that you saw. Um, this is the favela of Niteroi in Brazil. Uh, we did three there for a school built by Architecture for Humanity. This one is for food waste. The kitchen is going to be built here. The school is being built here. These are for toilet waste. We're keeping them separate. And then down here we have a constructed wetland that takes the slurry and grows uh, for the toilet waste ones, ornamental plants, and for the food waste one, food plants for the kids. And we're only separating them because of health regulations and concerns. If they don't maintain it right, we don't want to use toilet waste that may not have been properly treated if they aren't doing it right on food. But you could technically do it. If, as you said before, if you compost it afterwards, then you could use it. But we're separating the two of those. Um, so we have this one-year projection. We've, we would like to get five builds with the molds that I have uh, right now five builds at high profile locations within this first year, start educational outreach at current project sites and train a core group of biogas installers, and then replicate the biogas installation with three other small groups. I right now uh, have 10 gas holders, and every biodigester needs a gas holder, and we import them in batches of 10. I have 10, so the first 10 I'm giving away to our early adopters because I want to seed this and make people comfortable. They each cost us about 350 and then there's the shipping prices, so we need to order them in 10. So after we've exhausted the first 10, then we'll need to raise funds to buy more gas holders. The molds are here now. We've already paid for the molds. So we're going to do five and then three more, which is eight, and then there'll be two others. And then we have to look at ways of getting more of these in. Uh, and then we're looking at the getting one for every state in the union. Um, hold elections for a board of directors for our 501c3 organization. Establish comp committee for fundraising and capital campaign. Three-year plan, establish a biogas educational center in the Hudson Valley in Pennsylvania and in Mexico. Obtain two additional sets of Pusheen molds. Implement research and methodology for soilless food production with bioslurry. And we'll have a written manual for reclaiming communities with biogas hubs. And then after five years, bring 50 Pusheen molds to regions across the U.S build up to 2,000 new biodigesters every year because we'll have 50 molds and then have chapters. And we think of solar cities in a way like Alcoholics Anonymous. No overt leader that could inhibit the growth of the movement. Leadership in each of the hubs that by, by being bound by a constitution feels that we're all in alignment and you can't use the solar cities brand if you're not bound by the constitution. But in terms of its mission, anybody, we're all, you're all, we're all solar cities. We all want Heliopolis on this planet. So we want a model with our NGO that makes it easier less rather than harder to, to make sure that this critical piece of solar energy, which we call the missing piece of the sustainability development puzzle, 
that this gets firmly in the center of all our movements. Because we've all got food waste and toilet waste, and we always will. It's the one constant that binds us all on this planet. There is nothing else that we can say I have in common with you if you went and met an Eskimo or you met a, uh, a tribes person from the Okavanga Delta. But this one thing we can all agree on no matter what our language and culture. So that's why we see this being a, uh, a bright future for us. And, uh, and it's playful. And we quote Albert Einstein, play is the highest form of research because when you're building biodigesters, you're having a great time. When my students go out, when they went out to Palestine, when they went to Israel, and when they went to the Dominican Republic, and when we were in Belize and in Mexico, we're playing in, in Slovakia, a group of, uh, of, um, of, of young women from a Catholic organization we met in Kenya, invited us to do an educational workshop, and they said, we don't want you to talk, come here and build. So I flew to Slovakia, we go up in the mountains, we're building, and then they said a prayer as they were building, and they plunge their hands into the cow manure that starts it, because you need like yogurt, starter culture. And they started hugging each other and shaking hands. And we're like, what are they doing? And they said, this is God's creation. And from the smallest, we can do the largest things. We're not afraid of this. Now they'd learned in Kenya that only the women in the Maasai are allowed to touch cow dung. Men are afraid. But women build houses out of it. They make cooking fuel out of it, but it's very smoky. This time, you're making using the same cow manure where there's no smoke. And so they, they realized that they had, as women, they had this historical tradition that they weren't afraid of poo. They change babies, they work with it, and they're not afraid of body stuff. And the cow manure is, is not harmful anyway. So when we got back to Kenya, we're building with the Maasai. Edwin, the Maasai leader, has got all the guys with boots on and gloves, and they got shovels, and they're lifting the poo into barrels to take it to our digester. And the women are laughing, and the children are laughing at the boma. And finally, Edwin says, enough! And he throws the shovel down, throws the gloves off, and goes, if women can do this, I can do this. And the women cheer, and the children cheer, and pretty soon the other men are like, he says, from this day forth, in this boma, in our Maasai community, men will not be ashamed to touch poo. We will use it as a solution. So there's a lot of, of great fun. And, and it's odorless. And it, yes, well, what, with the biodigester, after it has digested, it is, it smells like a barn, and it's not, there's no odor that you would get if you were the user. If you put your nose up to this tank, you'll go, oh, where's the horse? Right? It's, there's no gag reflex, because all those compounds, the mercaptans and the sulfates and the phenols and all that, they're not in there because the microbes have digested them. So it neutralizes the gag response toxicity of it. But it does have a slight odor. And the Indian systems, they're completely open. There's no seal. So most people in North America don't want an Indian open system. Even though if you stand here and it's there, you'd never smell it. In Kathy's system, because it's completely sealed, apart from when we were building it and loading it and then unloading it, there was some smell in the basement, but you can describe it. Um, well, the only time we really have um, like any odor is if, for any reason, I accidentally like leave one of the valves closed for the overflow, and then you know then it would overspill. But you know we've come up with a new system now where we're not like using the buckets on top of it anymore, and um, you know I'm going to be like collecting all of it into a, like a larger container because we're going to be using that slurry as kind of like the start of your yogurt culture almost for other bills we're going to be doing such as in Hudson and also on um, that permaculture farm in Ellenville as well. Really, and how do we really no smell in the basement. What about combustibility? I mean, is it day, uh, safety? It's um, lighter than air, um, you know, where my system is really show. tight and so like we keep the gas like um, outside. Do you have a lighter? The lighter is I right there on the, the lighter. So, so you go ahead. Thank you.